to New Jersey Institute of Technology. My name is Dr. Thomas Ortiz. I'm a board certified family physician and the uh, chief medical and information officer here at the Garden Practice Transformation Network. Uh, we represent uh, physicians and physicians, uh, this is part of our learning activities. For those of you who have joined uh, the Garden Practice Transformation Network uh, as a participating physician in practice, and what we're trying to do here is learn more about how we can transform and perform. Transform and perform under the new uh, regulations that, that are being put out by MACRA and MIPS, and also uh, just in general uh, moving into the value-based system from fee-for-service. It's a paradigm shift that we're all uh, being affected by, uh, primary care physicians and specialists uh, alike. Today I have a special guest that I'd like to introduce to you. Uh, his name is Dr. Gregory uh, Nicola. He's the uh, Vice President uh, at the Hackensack Radiology uh, Group. And uh, also he's in a unique position as he chairs the American College of Radiology Macro Committee. And what we want to talk about today with you is uh, a little bit about one of, the, uh, one of the measures that we have in our uh, so-called metrics or KPIs, and that's the, the, the measure of uh, unnecessary imaging, particularly in the case of low back. But I'd like Dr. Nicole, if you could just uh, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you could tell us a little about your practice, your, your specialty experience, and, and the role that you currently play uh, representing radiologists. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Ortiz. My pleasure. Um, so I, I am the vice president of the Hacking Tech Radiology Group. It's a group of 40 doctors. We provide contractual services for three different hospitals in the Hackensack and Meridian Network. Um, how I originally got involved in value-based care really is kind of in a different way than most people. Um, I started interested, getting interested in health policy and running some of the quality measure development portions of my group. Um, and then I kind of accidentally fell upon um, being appointed to a position um, where I became an advisor to the relative value update committee for the American Medical Association. And this is an advisory committee that um, advises Medicare on physician reimbursement. Um, and what I always found interesting about that process is you, you would go to these meetings, there'd be lots of specialties, anywhere from primary care to pathology to surgery, discussing their value in the healthcare system. And I always felt that the word value was very nebulous um, and that there probably was more meaning to it than, than I got out of those meetings. I'm still an advisor there, but I'm still seeking the quest for what value really means. Um, and kind of all this experience between the coding and reimbursement world, running quality for a fairly large radiology practice, um, gave me the experience and the know-how um, where I was appointed the chair of the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act Committee for the ACR. Um, and what I did on that committee is um, we formed a number of um, experts in the, in the policy world to look at the rulemaking language Medicare put out and just discuss how we thought it would impact radiologists, um, met with Medicare and um, try to influence the regulations to make sure that first our membership could understand it and second that they could succeed at providing value-based care. Um, and then, um, So you, you're telling me that doctors are at the table yes. having these discussions about how all the regulations yeah. ACRA was actually formulated. That's right. And, and that's what got you interested in transformation in general. Yes, and I think, well, actually, transformation came as a side, as a side because of this quest for determining what value is. Um, and what I saw in a combination in the reimbursement world and the value world is that there tended to be um, some overuse of imaging or diagnostic testing um, in not necessarily appropriate situations. And I really wanted to strive for appropriate use of imaging because there's clearly value in imaging, but it has to be appropriately performed. Um, and that attracted me to um, a project that the college was um, starting to institute at the time called the uh, Radiology Support Communication and Alignment Network, RSCAN. And RSCAN um, w was around for several years, and w what its goal was, it's, it's all in the title, was number one, to, to really empower the radiologist on seeking value by improving communication with referring physicians and, and, and keeping that line of communication open. And that communication line has been somewhat severed by technology where PACS has kind of siloed um, the radiology specialty. Um, so one was to get radiologists out there talking more and try to provide value with the clinical team. Um, but it also looked at the Choosing Wisely campaign and when things were being 
appropriately ordered and when they weren't being appropriately ordered. And, and the whole purpose of the project was to work with other referring physicians to improve value and approve the appropriateness or make sure a study was being performed appropriately so that it was right for the patient and right for the physician and right for the diagnosis. So, so how, how should radiologists and primary care physicians be communicating with each other, particularly in this area of healthcare reform and transform, practice transformation? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a tough one because I, I can see both perspectives. The, the primary care doctor is swamped with work and patients and electronic health records, and the radiologist has been siloed into PACs, and those lines of communication have been broken. However, in my experience, when that communication line is open, there's much better value for the patient and much better care being performed. It's often that I'll see downstream effects from what looks like a well-written or well-dictated radiology report, but when you look at it from the eyes of a patient or in the eyes of a referring physician, it could be open to interpretation or sometimes seem nebulous. However, I think a direct phone conversation about that report often can solve a lot of issues, and it often does in my own clinical practice. So I hope that the lines of communication are, number one, opened when even a report um, leads to any kind of downstream consequences, whether a physician is um, considering biopsy or a repeat study or an additional study. I think a discussion is um, often warranted because I think a lot of questions can be answered. For example, the radiologist might not be aware of the patient's goals, and when that communication line is opened, it may change the interpretation of a report quite drastically and, and really help out on the direction of care for the patient. Well, we know that the, the, the primary care doctor is ordering the radiology testing, and, and generally the radiologist may not see the patient actually before the test sure. is done. Uh, so what is the responsibility of the radiologist to, to communicate with the uh, primary care doctor what's appropriately ordered and what's not appropriately ordered? Well, so I... I I think that, first of all, um, that, that's a tough question because the ordering volume is so high, and there's probably not the capacity for a radiologist to review every single order. Sure. Um, however, there are um, electronic ways that, that, that can be looked at. So, for example, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014 is going to require that referring physicians um, um, view or access authorized user criteria through some type of electronic means before they had ordered advanced imaging studies. Now, that law hasn't taken effect yet. It looks like it may take effect January 1st, 2018. That will certainly give the referring physician a lot of guidance on what's appropriate. However, there's going to be numerous situations where that guidance might not be enough. And I think that the process of seeking guidance just electronically at first um, will lead to the step of also in more advanced cases, reaching out to the radiologist, making sure that they're ordering appropriate studies. So hopefully that, there, that, that there's a stepwise process of communication being developed here. I think our scan also um, helps to promote that in that you're, you're establishing more of a direct communication line with your radiologist. I think what we see often is um, often in primary care, they might not know the patients as well as they used to, mm -hmm. and I think radiologists don't know the referring doctors as well they used to, and I think all those lines of communication should improve to improve value. So how does our scan, um, uh, in your opinion, improve, improve that communication? Well, well, one thing our scan does is it, it empowers radiologists to reach out to referring doctors because um, it gives you a mission. Um, it gives you a set of topics to discuss. It gives you the background of when something's appropriate and when it's not. It's a set of research tools and um, education material for you to really educate yourself and the primary care doctor. Um, and I think as a radiologist, we, we certainly read a large volume of studies, and I, I sometimes occasionally sit there and wonder, am I adding value? Am I going to answer the question on this, or was this the appropriate study? So I, I certainly don't read a study hoping that I don't come up with an answer. I always want to come up with an answer. And in order to come up with an appropriate answer, often a study has to be appropriate. So I, I would love to encourage it from the whole paradigm, the whole circle to be appropriate would be the, the best case scenario for myself. So we're, we involve a set of guidelines that, that help doctors make decisions on terms of particularly the, the more expensive scan and the MRI, Correct, yeah. the CAT scans, the, the uh, invasive tests. Uh, obviously, um, that, that has an impact on radiology in terms of, of going from – this whole system has an impact on radiology, going from the fee-for-service, do more, get more, uh, as, a, as opposed to the value base, which is where you, you've proven the value uh, to the system in terms of quality and cost. Sure. Uh, so, you know, uh, we have this issue where, where CMS and Medicare uh, believe that savings uh, to avoid unnecessary imaging 
um, or utilizing imaging for either, you know, the defensive medicine purposes or just because you're in the emergency room in a particular situation. Uh, and, and, and we're talking specifically in, in terms of low back pain. Mm -hmm. um, how can the radiology groups work with PC, PCPs to be more cost effective? Sure. Knows, because we know there's a, there's a savings there to be had. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it, it's important to know that most low back pain imaging in the acute setting in the absence of trauma, but with, with new onset back pain and no risk factors, has very limited clinical utility. Right. Um, and I think that's an education effort that maybe lots of primary care doctors, or not just primary care doctors, lots of physicians might not understand, that they're very unlikely to get any useful information back in that, that so setting. As soon as a, a patient comes in with low back pain, does it mean they need to be imaged? No, it does not. In certain circumstances they do, but it does not mean they need to be imaged. And that, that's the, the when they need to be imaged with, no, with low risk factors is a complex question on, on what the patient wants out of the experience. Um, but, but at the same time, we do have to keep in mind that the clinical utility is fairly low and that conservative management is certainly something that should be tried first. Um, and uh, that, that sometimes needs a discussion between radiologists and the primary care doctor. Also, um, what exact, if you did have to image, what's the appropriate imaging modality? Um, it varies based on the clinical symptoms and the patient's risk factors and what the patient can tolerate. And those are all discussions that should be had between the radiologist and, and the referring physician. Should I order CAT, should I order MRI? Correct, yeah, X-ray, sure. So that, that would be a discussion that should occur between the uh, primary care doctor and the radiologist before the test is ordered. Absolutely. I think when in doubt that discussion is imperative. Um, I think it also helps if the study is ordered because it, between the doctors it's decided it could be appropriate. It also helps the radiologist focus on what they need to try to answer because there's been a discussion had of what exactly are the goals of the imaging study. So how about in cases of trauma? Uh, would you say that that's, those rules hold? Yeah, I think in most cases of you know, a significant trauma where the patient's coming to a doctor for, for the, the, I think imaging is often necessary in those cases. Um, but, but, you know, it really has to be a, some, a significant trauma where, where there's persistent pain. But yeah, it seems like um, low back pain tends, tends to be one of the reasons why people visit the doctor more commonly in, the, in this country than, yeah. than for any other problem. So you can see why so much testing uh, may be inappropriate. Like you say, it doesn't improve the clinical outcome necessarily uh, as the treatment goes forward. Is that, is that true in your mind? I, in a lot of cases with non-traumatic, no risk back, back pain, like back pain where somebody's, you know, maybe had an injury but not, not necessarily a significant trauma, um, the back pain imaging is often of no utility. Yeah, I mean, it so provides it, little information. So in this time of, of reform and value-based care, uh, picking the right codes uh, in terms of how you're making the diagnosis is key because when we're measuring these things electronically uh, and we're compiling new and denominators to look at, say, a particular ratio of low back pain diagnosis to the, to the number of tests that are, that are ordered within 30 days of the visit, uh, which is the measure that we're looking at in this particular sure. uh, PTN, um, is, 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 is the issue, essentially, is the issue. And, and there are a significant number of tests that could be avoided um, if the doctor felt comfortable with their own diagnosis. Yeah, I, I think this leads to an important point here that imaging is not no risk. For example, we find incidental findings that most of the time mean nothing but require further follow-up because scientifically we don't quite know what they are, um, which puts undue more um, economic stress on the system, stress on the patient for having to take the time off to have that, that you know, incidental finding followed. Um, and, it, you know, there's an exposure to, if it's a CAT scan, there's an exposure to radiation. If you need a contrast dye, whether it's MR or CT, there's a risk to that. So imaging is not without risk, and I think that's also need to be in, included in the conversation with the patient. That also, you know, not, not only could imaging be of low utility, there could be a risk downstream, and there's a lot of reasons to avoid it, but there are also a lot of reasons to perform it in the correct situation. And the key word here is appropriate. It has to be appropriate, and there are set guidelines for that that, that um, certainly the radiologists can educate the community on. So do uh, radiologists work with their colleagues in the emergency room, for instance, in this particular? Uh... Absolutely, and I, I'm doing that now with, uh, with Joseph Feldman, the chair of the emergency department at Hackensack University Medical Center. He's been a big champion of, of appropriate 
good imaging and, and back pain even before I, I entered the scene, um, but him and I have paired up on a appropriate imaging throughout the ER and built a number of care paradigms um, with um, homegrown clinical decision support in our EHR system where we can help clinicians work through complex clinical problems. You, you know, it's hard for, for doctors have a lot to remember, especially in the emergency room setting, and it's hard to remember every sin, single clinical tree paradigm that you need to when, when imaging appropriate is not. And we've built the, that ability into our EHR system oh, yeah. to help physicians work through those issues. So that's a success story in itself. Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're really early on in it, and it's just being launched, but we, we expect that it will be successful. So looking forward to seeing some. Uh, yeah, we are too. We're very excited about it. On that. But how do you how do you uh, balance that with the with the threat of lawsuits or um, you know defensive medicine as as part of the reasons to, to do these tests? Yeah, I mean that, that's always a concern, especially in the emergency department. But we we do have to remember there are other threats too. For example, um, opioid use in the ER for back pain. Um, there, there's lots of ways that you have to control utilization. I think that if you follow best practice guidelines. Um, that, that that itself um, is is a reasonable um, case for yourself of, of appropriate imaging. I think we're, we're following best practice guidelines. We're not trying to deviate from those. Um, and I think because you do more than best practice guidelines doesn't mean you're protected. Um, so I, I think that that can be a liability in itself, um, exposing patients to unnecessary contrast or radiation. I mean, there's all sorts of liabilities with that as well. And you believe these about. guidelines, you know, are, are across the board, best practices, not just locally, uh, but also oh, oh, across the region or state? or Sure. So American College of Radiology's guidelines are multi-specialty guidelines. Okay. Um, they've um, taken multi-specialty stakeholders and gotten their advice, um, and they're choosing wisely topics. Um, which is a national campaign. Um, so yes, they are founded in research. Um, and at Hackensack, um, not only did we use best practice guidelines, um, we also formed multidisciplinary teams to pro provide input for back pain. For example, we had orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery approve our protocols. So um, their best practice and their also local practice um, incorporated into that to make sure that it's tailored to our needs. And, and we feel pretty strongly that they're, they're the way to properly provide value to our patients. Very important because, you know, we, we, we promote the team approach to care. And sure. so, so getting everybody kind of up to speed uh, into what, what we're trying to accomplish here is very important. And that was the R scans purpose. Again, it's about communication was a key word in R scan and, and um, well, certainly R scan has improved communication in our department um, across specialties and hopefully it will in the community. So some uh, uh, doctors uh, out there wanted to find more about R scan, mm -hmm. where, where would they go? So uh, acr.org is the American College of Radiology's website. And it's, yeah, and it's our scans on the front page there. You, there's lots of tabs you can click on. But I also suggest um, reaching out to your office, the New Jersey Innovation Institute, um, because the Garden Practice Transform Transformation Network um, is, a, is a partner of, of our scan and um, certainly can put, put you in touch with radiology groups who are trying to participate in value-based care and provide insight and guidance for um, doctors who feel that they need it. So I understand it's very key then for uh, the PCP, the primary care physician, the internist, the uh, specialist in the office to have a good relationship with their, with their radiology group yeah. locally so they can open those lines of communication. But it's also res the responsibility of the radiologist Absolutely. to make themselves available mm -hmm. at any time during the, during the regular business hours to, to get on the phone with, 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 the, uh, with the PCP when they have questions. Would you agree? I do agree, and I think that's the transition to value. I think that's a, that is a, such a key point that all of us, no matter what specialty you're practicing, have to decide where are you adding value. And, and I can tell you in my practice, I, that I can feel value being added when I have a conversation with a primary care doctor or any clinician that's calling me and when I have a conversation with a patient. So I cherish those moments, and I think I, I know that's when I know I'm providing value. So doctors, you know, reach out to your radiologist to see how uh, they can cooperate with you in terms of uh, making good decisions about uh, radiology testing uh, and uh, trying to avoid the unnecessary tests, particularly in the area of uh, in initial low back pain. Uh, can you give me maybe a success story or two where uh, you've improved quality and, and lowered costs uh, um, with this program? So certainly at the ACR level, we have a number of success stories with our scan. I can point to my colleagues at Baylor where Mark Willis instituted um, clinical guidelines with his emergency department for pulmonary embolism. Um, and pre-intervention compared to post-intervention, they saw a 30 to 50% reduction in CT for pulmonary embolism studies being ordered. 
We have a number of colleagues across the country which we're seeing 30% reduction in back pain imaging being ordered with no effects on clinical outcome whatsoever. Um, improved outcomes, maybe improved maybe, satisfaction. Maybe absolutely, possibly improved satisfaction, and certainly we're not finding downstream incentive findings that mean nothing and cause even more cost to the system. And I think when any time a, 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 a physician or any kind of clinician thinks about value for the patient, you really have to keep in mind um, not only the quality you provide, but what kind of cost are you in, uh, incurring to the system? Because I, I think the clinical community is the most educated in quality, and they need to educate themselves on the kind of costs they're incurring to the system and to the patient, because those are our responsibility. You know, we say, what, what, what's the, I ask students and medical students, what, what's the most expensive instrument that, that a doctor uses? Uh, and it happens to be the pen, or in this case, the mouse, uh, in terms of every time you order a test, uh, you are adding cost, and, and doctors uh, need to understand that they do have a significant impact uh, on, on the cost of care delivery to the yes. patient because the medications they order, the labs they order, the consults they order, and the, and the radiology that they order all adds to the total cost of care in that particular individual. So I, I'd like to thank you very much for this uh, very thank important you. discussion and uh, just to show uh, our doctors out there that we're not just about primary care, we're about specialty care and about working together as a team to provide the best quality outcomes that we could possibly produce at the best possible cost that we could possibly produce. So it's all about cost and quality, guys, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, let's, let's uh, follow up and we'll have to continue this conversation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.